many of you uh, preach or teach in the local church? Raise your hand. Okay. You know probably that uh, preaching and preachers have seen better days. Right? Uh, some, uh, some blame this on the listener. Some suggest that people have lost their capacity to listen. Or as my cousin Michael likes to say, people are so broke they can't even afford to pay attention anymore. Uh, but I don't think the listener is entirely to blame for the problems with preaching today. I actually think listeners still show up full of hopeful hope, even if hanging by a thread, that the preacher will offer something from the soul for the soul. Deep will cry out to deep. Listeners still come to church searching for soul preaching in a sea of soulless sermons. Mm. The primary problem with preaching today is not inattentive listening. It's soulless preaching. You know, probably, that uh, preachers are burning out in bunches because they've lost their joy in ministry. Yeah. And if you ask preachers to tell you the truth about how much they enjoy preaching, many of them will say, I don't like to preach. <laughs> and I think one of the reasons is because too many preachers, myself included, have been taught that we have to separate our devotional reading of Scripture for the soul from our homiletical reading of Scripture for the sermon. In other words, we've been taught to go about preaching as a rhetorical chore not as a devotional journey deeper into the Christ who's called us to preach. And when that happens, the preacher loses his or her soul. And when the preacher loses the soul, all sorts of crazy things happen. One of the things that happens is preachers start downloading and preaching other people's sermons as if they were their own. <laughs> None of you would ever do that, but some do. Or, or this happens more often, uh, when a preacher loses his or her soul, they start preaching sermons that say absolutely nothing of substance about God, yeah. Father, Son, or Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sermons that can be applied to finances or dating or marriage or emotions or whatever without any relational connection to or dependence upon God Almighty. These preachers have lost their soul. They imply that you can, you can extract uh, propositional principles from the Word of God to get what you want from God, and then you don't really need God at all. Soulless preaching at its worst. After about uh, 10 years of preaching, I hit a wall uh, that caused me to lose my preaching soul. I, I didn't download and preach other people's sermons as if they were my own, in case you're wondering. <laughs> and I think most of my sermons, if not all of them, said something, even if just a little bit, about God. But I began to view preaching as a rhetorical chore and not as a devotional journey deeper into the Christ who called me to preach. I lost my soul. And so I went on a search to rediscover my preaching soul. I actually uh, wrote my doctoral dissertation on that topic, not to get a degree, <laughs> but to find my soul. <laughs> I, I, I was wrestling with the question. I was driven by the question, how can I get my preaching soul back? How can I... Uh, once again find that love and joy and passionate conviction to flow in and through me as I preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And I made a few discoveries along the way. Can I share those with you? Yeah. Okay. I discovered that if, if, if a preacher is going to preach with soul, they've got to be caught up in a sacred love triangle with God, with people, and with scripture, very much like Colleen just shared. I think she looked at my PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. <laughs> when we read the sermons and the teaching of Jesus, uh, we get the sense that he was preoccupied with the Father. He was enamored with the Father. Uh, Jesus was not driven in his preaching by the question, what can I do to impress people with who I am, but what can I do to impress people with who the Father is? He was driven by that. That kept him going. He was preoccupied with the Father, and he preached that way. 
And I think one of the reasons for that is because he just stayed in constant connection with the Father. And the pace of his ministry was frenetic. It was crazy. It, there were ups and downs. There were challenges. Nobody was more busy in ministry than Jesus Christ. And yet he found a way to stay connected to the Father. And by doing that, he remembered who he was and whose he was and why he was doing what he was doing and who he was doing it for. I have friends who uh, travel for work. And when they travel, uh, in order to stay faithful to their family, because there's a lot of temptations on the road out there, they'll tuck pictures of their family all over the place, on their phone, their computer. Uh, they'll cut out pictures, put them on the uh, dashboard, on the hotel mirror, uh, in their suitcase, so that when they open their suitcase when they're traveling, they'll see a picture of their family just to remember to be faithful, to remember those to whom they belong. And I think the preacher needs to do the same. The preacher needs to tuck pictures of God into every nook and cranny of the process of developing and delivering sermons. If not, they quickly forget why they're doing what they're doing and who they're doing it for. So here's some things I, I, I did uh, and still do as a preacher. I call these preoccupation soul preaching practices. It's a mouthful. But I ask these two questions constantly. What of substance will my sermon say about God? And if it doesn't say anything about God, by Sunday morning, I'm not preaching that sermon. I'm coming up with something else. How can I make God the hero of this particular sermon? Because God is the hero of the biblical story, right? He ought to be the hero of every sermon. And then I have these preoccupation scriptures from the Apostle Paul. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. No matter how eloquent or gifted or skilled I am or am not, at the end of the sermon's day, if people are going to be impacted, it's not because of me. It's because God showed up. Paul to the Ephesians in Acts 20 says, For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Not the opinion of Paul, the whole will of God. And then these two preoccupation prayers that I pray. Usually just before I preach. Lord, I pray that people come away more impressed with who you are than with who I am. Which is not all that difficult because God's pretty impressive and I'm not. <laughs> Lord, I pray that the words I speak and how I speak them will be congruent with your word and how you speak it. Okay. Love for people. The preacher is not just a prophet representing God to humanity. The preacher is also a priest representing humanity to God. The preacher is not just called to reveal the will, the way, the word of God. The preacher is also called to articulate the hopes and hurts, the dreams, the disappointments of the people to whom he or she preaches. How dare the preacher proclaim the love of a God who jumped into human flesh and not be willing to do the same through the sermon. <laughs> compassion enables soul preaching. I'm not talking about a warm, fuzzy I'm talking about a compassion that's deep in the bowels of the soul and actually causes pain in the pit of your belly for the people to whom you preach. I'm surprised at the number of people preachers who just when they preach don't seem to love the people to whom they preach yeah. you know? it's like they're, they're just not there it's like it's, there's no real passionate conviction that I sense sometimes there's no soul they're preaching with no sense of urgency as if they're selling Ginsu knives or Amway products you know they're more in love with their well-written manuscript than the people out there to whom they preach they're they're more in love with their eloquence than the people out there. They're more in love with their insight than the people out there to whom they're to provide the manna, the word of God. Well, here's what I do to make sure I'm caught up in this love triangle with people to whom I preach. This is not rocket science. Uh, pray the directory. Once you get a sense of what the text is saying and will say through the sermon, Start praying through the names of your people or the faces of your people or the prayer list. And pray specifically into their lives. How is Renee going to hear this? Lord, her, her marriage is hanging by a thread. May she hear this word of hope in this way. A 16-year-old Johnny is suicidal. God, help him to hear this message in this way. Dave LeBron is struggling with a heroin addiction. Help him to hear the message this way, this day. 
And then pray about how the word might address the hopes and hurts of people in your community, in your nation, and your world, so that the sermon is not flying around in some cloud of esoteric, conceptual mumbo jumbo, but it's actually earthed in the realities of the real people to whom you preach. Finally, I think I have a minute left. Um, no, you're good. Okay. Four. 20 minutes left? All right. Uh, <laughs> Finally, uh, the other part of the sacred love triangle is loving the scriptures. You cannot preach from the soul if you are the master with the scalpel slicing and dicing the scriptures, standing in control over it, taming it, stifling it. The only way to preach from the soul is to hand the scalpel to scripture and say, O two-edged sword, cut me. Challenge me, confirm me, correct me, rebuke me. Guide me, transform me. I know lots of people who know the Bible way better than most of us would, but they don't preach with soul because they stand in control over it instead of submitting themselves to it. The sermons we preach with the most power are the ones in which we wrestle with the angel of the text and come away limping under the weight of a word from the Lord for the people of the Lord. So, at some point in your preparation process, you connect with the text devotionally that you're going to bring to people. Don't let the text lay a hand on your people if it hasn't laid a hand on you. Before the word of God does something through us, it must do something to us. I know that sounds like a duh, but a lot of preachers don't have the liberty to do that. You do now. <laughs> Sense your way into the passage. Connect imaginatively with the passage, playfully, prayerfully. Imagine Paul when he's writing that letter to the Philippian church from a Roman prison cell because he won't shut up about Jesus. What does he look like? How does he hold his pen? Are there prison guards? Are there prisoners? How does that cell smell? Sense your way into the passage. The Bible grows out of the situations of real people in a real place at a real time with real issues. Capture that. Last thing. Some of you will remember love connection. <laughs> if you do, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me focus here, though. Uh, it's Michelangelo's creation. The preacher is the finger of Adam pointing to God and the finger of God touching Adam. The preacher is in that fingertip point, representing the heart of God and the hope of humanity. And like Chuck Willery, a love connection, the preacher becomes a courier between two lovers trying to exchange letters with each other. That's what we get to do when we preach. That's soul preaching. And the church is in desperate need of it. Thanks.